leading your home. Leading your home. So it will be obviously more applicable to uh, the men in here because men are who God has ordained to be the leaders in all areas of life. You know, whether it's family, whether it's church, whether it's government, we're going to look at a few verses there. So we're going to talk about a few things about being a leader. But even though you're not a man in the congregation today, I want you to pay attention because don't switch off just because a sermon may not apply to you directly because you as ladies, one day you're going to have to teach a man. You know, you may need to teach a man what it means to be a godly man. You know, if you're a mother and you think, I don't need to know these things. Well, no, you need to know what it means to be a strong leader too because you want to be able to train your son to, to, ra- to, be raised, to, 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 to grow up into a godly leader, into a strong leader. So there's never anything in the Bible that is unprofitable. All scripture is given by inspiration from, uh, of God and is profitable for doctrine. So even if it doesn't apply to you directly, you don't want to switch off. You want to learn these things because you also need to learn these things to defend the faith. You know, when people say, oh, you know, uh, you know people are saying now, oh, Christianity is just patriarchal and it's just oppressive to women. Um, and that's, you know, that's not what it's all about at all. And if you don't know why God has men in charge, why God has appointed men as, as, as leaders and the reasoning behind it, then you're not going to be able to answer those critics and defend the faith. So we're going to be talking about three different things when it comes to leading your home. One is God's intention for the family. Why are men in charge? Number two is I want to talk a bit about how to get your wife to follow you. You know, because a lot of men ask that question. Hey, how do I get my wife to follow me? So I want to give some advice there. And the last thing I want to talk about is why it's important. Why it's important that we lead our home as men. All right, so God's intention is the first one we want to talk about. And it's no secret if you read your Bible that men are in charge in the Bible. And we can make it it sound politically correct. We can say, you know, men lead and women follow. But it's the same, whether you say men rule and women submit, maybe that just doesn't sound as good politically, but that's what it means when men lead and women follow. A follower has to submit to somebody who's in charge, who's a ruler. And this is how God has it. And he has it in all areas. So whether it comes to the family, right? Men are in charge. Whether it comes to the church. So why does it naturally flow on to the church? It's because church is just a congregation of families, isn't it? And it's the same in society because society is just a, a, a bigger, you know, congregation or not congregation, but a bigger group of families. Look in Isaiah 3. Look at what it says here. It says, As for my people, children are their oppressors and women rule over them. So you see, when Israel is in a bad way, when they're away from the Lord, what is God saying? He's saying, Hey, children are in charge. And women are in charge because what's ideal? Ideal is men are in charge. And if you think about when we talked about Ahab as a king, and remember how he was really childish. That's what it's talking about, where it's like children are in charge, they're either really childish as well, or that women are the ones giving the orders, right? Women are the ones that are in charge. And this is not ideal in the Bible. It says here, Oh, my people, they which lead thee, And talking about Israel in those days, which are children and women, cause thee to err. Go in the wrong way. Do wrong things. And we're going to talk about why that is when women are in charge. They get people away from following God's word and away from the right paths when women and children start to take over the society from men and destroy the way of thy paths. So we can see here, even from a government level, God had men in charge. Now we go to the church in 1 Timothy 2. Let the women learn in silence. And we talked about this, I think, uh, last week. Let the women learn in silence with all subjection. But I suffer not a woman to teach, look at this, nor to usurp authority over the man, 
but to be in silence. So I won't go into what that means. Uh, it wasn't last week, I think it was the week before. But we see here that even in the church, God has ordained it that men are in charge. Now, why is that? We're actually given two reasons in 1 Timothy 2 why men are put in charge. It says here, but to be in silence. Verse 13, for or because Adam was first formed, then Eve. So one reason why men are in charge is because that's just how God has ordained it. Right? So that's just one reason. God has chosen that one gender was in charge of the other and women was created for the man. That's one reason. That's just God ordained. Now, obviously, some people might not accept that if they don't just want to believe what God says, or don't want to just go with God says. So what are some other reasons why God has it that way? Well, look at verse 14. It says here, And Adam was not deceived... But the woman being deceived was in the transgression. Notwithstanding, she shall be saved in childbearing if they continue in faith and charity and holiness and sobriety. So the second reason why God has men in charge, because part of a nature of women is they are more emotional. Now, are there women that aren't always as emotional as men? But because women uh, tend to have uh, a more emotionally driven they're, they're, they're weaker emotionally and, and they are more easily deceived. They're just more easily influenced. That's what the Bible's teaching here. It's saying here, Adam wasn't deceived. See, when Adam ate of the fruit of the tree, he made that, he wasn't, he wasn't conned into it by the snake. He knew he was disobeying God. But what happened to Eve? Eve was actually conned into, she was deceived into eating of that fruit and listening to something else. And that's one reason why God doesn't have women in charge. And that's why when women are in charge, it leads them astray because they are much more easily influenced than men. You know, whether you account that for their emotions, whether you account that for their just, you know, being philosophically stronger, but we see that, we just see that as a reality. As a reality, women are more influenced than men. I don't know if you've ever known women like this, but, you know, sometimes you'll have a, a lady who's dating a guy and then, you know, she's kind of just on board with whatever she says. But then she dates somebody else that believes something completely different. And now she's just on board with that. Whereas men don't tend to do that as much. Men tend to be a bit more principled and know what they believe, think things through. Now, I'm not just being sex. I'm just saying this is, a, this is a stereotype. Obviously, I'm not saying it applies in all cases. But as a general rule, this is what women are like. And God knows that. And that's one reason why women are in charge. And this is why, um, why men are in charge. And this is what this chapter is teaching us. So in verse 14, it says, Adam was not deceived, but the woman being deceived was in the transgression. Notwithstanding, she shall be saved in childbearing if they continue in faith and charity and holiness with sobriety. So one thing we learn in the Bible, and we're not going to go there, um, but if you, if you read uh, in other places in 1 Corinthians, um, in terms of what it means to be saved in childbearing, that's one reason why it's a good idea for women to marry, bear children, guide the house, because it actually keeps them out of trouble. This is what the Bible teaches. And if women are you know, taking care of their children, the Bible teaches that you know, they don't go from house to house being idle and tattlers and busybodies. So this is one reason why it's saying here, she shall be saved in childbearing. It's, you know, a lot of people will joke sometimes about this verse and say, you know, does, does a woman need to have babies in order to be saved and go to heaven? No, this salvation is not talk, this saved is not talking about our spiritual salvation. It's being saved from the deception of the world, getting them to be a busybody rather than being a mother, which is much more valuable um, job to do. Now, Hebrews 13. So we not only see the rule in the government, we see men in charge it should, be, should be in charge in the government, men should be in charge in the church, but also men should be in charge in the family. So we're talking about reasons why men are in charge. One is because God has just ordained it that way. The second is, is because women are not as stable philosophically and emotionally, and they're more easily swayed. So there's a bit more safety in a man being in charge, especially in church. Right? When it comes to church, when it comes to doctrine, a man's not just going to be tossed to and fro with every wind of doctrine, whereas a woman is more likely to be, and that's why men are in charge. Now, the last reason is, and I think this is one of, uh, one of the most important, but the last reason is in verse 13, look, uh, in Hebrews 13. Look what it says here in verse 17. 
Obey them that have the rule over you and submit yourselves, for they watch for your souls. So this is an exhortation to followers to submit to leadership, right? Whether or not it's in your, it's in your house, or whether it's at church or even in government, there are certain rulers put in place that we ask to submit to as long as it lines up with God's commandments. But look at what it says here. For they watch for your souls as they that must give account, that they may do it with joy and not with grief, for that is unprofitable for you. So three reasons why I believe God has put men in charge. One is because it's ordained that way. Second is because men are more stable as a leader, emotionally and philosophically. But the last one is the reason why men are in charge is because they are accountable. See, like God doesn't hold the wife accountable for the family. He holds the husband in, in, accountable for that family and the growth and the spiritual uh, health of that family. And just like at your workplace, whoever is given accountability and responsibility for that business is given also the authority. So wouldn't it make sense that if God is holding the man accountable for his family, that he also has the authority? And that's why men are, 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 are in that authority because they are given to an account to God, whereas women aren't. Women are accountable for their children, but they're not accountable for the family like men are. And that's why when you come to churches, men are accountable for the church. The bishops are accountable for the church. That's why they have the authority and it, it should flow on like that into government as well. Now let's look here uh, in 1 Timothy 5 where we talk about why women should marry, bear children, and guide the house. In verse 9, Let not a widow be taken into the number under threescore years old, having been the wife of one man. So in 1 Timothy 5, it's talking about taking on workers in the church. And what the Bible is teaching here is, you know, you don't take on a female worker who's a widow, because only widows work for the church. You don't take on a widow who's less than 60 years old. Right? having been the wife of one man, well reported of for good works, if she had brought up children, if she had lodged strangers, if she had washed the saints' feet. So there's some qualifications there. It's not just any widow can be taken on by the church uh, as a worker. If she had relieved the afflicted, if she had diligently followed every good work, but the younger widows refuse, for when they have begun to wax wanton against Christ, they will marry, having damnation because they have cast off their first faith. So this is not damnation, meaning they lose their salvation. We'll read on what it's, the damnation is talking about. And with all they learn to be idle, wandering about from house to house, and not only idle, but tattlers also, and busybodies speaking things which they ought not. Now, I probably don't have to convince you that it's, it's, it's a more of a tendency for women to be busybodies and, and chit-chat than it is for men. You know, like men don't set up Facebook groups just to like talk about other people. You know what I mean? Like, th but this is what women do. You see women, women will set up Facebook groups and, and they just hang out and they just chit chat and they just talk about other people's matters. So this is what it's trying to save women from saying, hey, if a woman is busy taking care of children, then she doesn't have a tendency to be snared by those things. So he says, not only idle, but tattlers also and busybodies, speaking things which they ought not. I will therefore. So because there's a danger for women to do these things, he's saying, this is what I want for young women. I will therefore that the younger women marry, bear children, guide the house. Look at this. Give none occasion. Don't give an opportunity to the adversary to speak reproachfully. Look at this, for some are already turned aside after Satan. So this is what it's talking about when it says she'll be saved in childbearing. You know, she's being saved from being turned aside after Satan, being an idle tattler and a busybody because she's busy doing what God has called her to do and that's to be a mother and raise children. Now this passage is not politically correct. This passage is not popular in the world. And this passage is not even popular amongst Christians. Right? You tell Christians this is what God wills for a young lady and they get upset. But is there anything unclear about this passage? 
You know, is Victor making this up? Is Victor just trying to be a patriarchal tyrant? No, it's just that's as clear as day. This is what the Bible teaches. The, the Bible teaches that for young women, this is what God wants from a young woman, to marry, bear children, guide the house, give none occasion to the adversary to speak reproachfully. And you think that's oppressive. No, this is not oppressive at all because this is what is most valuable. There's nothing more valuable to a woman than to be a mother. Now, I've been thinking about this for a bit, but let's say, for example, people say, oh, yeah, but you know, men don't have to look after children. Like, men can do whatever they want, right? Men can go and work here and work there and do this and do that. But you know what the, you know what the common thread is? Men have to work. That's what men do. Men, men are called to provide for their house. So yeah, a man might go work a job, he might start a business, he might play a sport for a living, but ultimately men do all these things to make money. Right? And guess what? Who are they providing for? The family, the house. So it's still all about raising the children. So you see when we think, oh yeah, women are better at raising children. Yeah, because women are better at raising children because that's where God wants them. And men are better at making money because that's where God wants them. So that's why men go out and make money and they do all different things to make money. But ultimately, you're not meant to be making that money for yourself. You're meant to be making that money so that you can raise children and then the wife can be at home raising the children because she's the one bearing the children, breastfeeding. And, and that's why it's no, there's no shock why women are better at raising children. This is why women make better nurses. This is why women you know, make better uh, carers and better daycare workers because that's what they are called to do. That's what they're better at. And men are better at starting a profession, doing those things because that's what they're called to do. They're called to bring in income for the family. So don't get this idea that there's just all these different things that you can do right? because, and, and think that what this is doing is, is oppressive. This is what matters in life. You know, when ladies want to go and chase a career and do something, get away from the home, and, and they think that that's liberating for them, I, I just think, yeah, okay, you're getting away from the home, but now you're just doing something of less value. You know, like, why leave something of less value, uh, leave something of greater value to do something of lesser value? So the reason why God wants women to marry and bear children and guide the house is because that's what's most important. And this is why you even go and work, guys. And you think about why do I even go and make a living? It's to provide for my house. It's so that my children have a house to stay, so that my wife can stay home and raise the children. And uh, that's, that's, that's very important. Now, what somebody might say is, they might say, well, this is just talking about widows. I'll say, if you're a widow, then God wants you to marry, bear children, and guide the house. But not if you're not a widow. Now, just think about this for a second. That doesn't make sense at all. Because what you're saying then is, let's say a woman marries at 20, and then she's widowed at 25. And you're saying, well, that woman, because she's a widow, she has to marry, bear children, and guide the house. That's clear, because this is the younger, this context is talking about widows, and I get that, right? And they're saying, well, that's just God's will just for a widow. But then you're saying, but, if a, but it's fine for a woman who's unmarried to just work and work and work up until she's 40. So a 40-year-old woman, God's will for that woman is it's fine to go and chase a career. But if you're a young widow, then God's intention is that you marry, bear children, guide the house. That makes no sense at all. Does that make sense? If God's intention for a young woman is to marry, bear children, and guide the house, what difference does it make if she's a widow or not? Because he's saying, hey, if she's a young woman, I want you to marry, bear children, and guide the house. You don't think a woman who's been widowed at 25 could do what a 35-year-old does when they go, they go out and work a career? No, it's, just, it's the same thing. But see, God wants for a young woman what he wants for a young widow. Because what he wants for women is to marry, bear children, and guide the house. And that is what is important. That's what matters. That's why men should even be working. So if men work just to serve themselves, then they've already got the wrong priorities. 
You know, they're working just to make a name for themselves, or they're working just to build up wealth, or they're working just to, uh, you know, for pleasure. That's already the wrong priorities. Our priority should be our home. And that's why women looking after the home is the greatest thing that a woman can do. Let's continue. Now, let's talk about the family now, because I wanna, I wanna focus on men leading their home. Wives, submit yourselves unto your own husbands as unto the Lord. So very clear that men are in authority, not only at church and in government, but also in the home. For the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church, uh, is the head of the church, and he is the savior of the body. Therefore, as the church is subject unto Christ, so let the wives be to their own husbands in everything. So there's actually no exception there. Right? Women should obey their husbands in everything. Well, I guess, I guess you could say the exception is where it dis disagrees with God's commandments, right? So it's everything except where it, dis it disagrees with what God commands them. But when it's not a sin to do, a woman is expected to obey her husband in what her husband commands her to do if it's not a sin to do. But that's not where the story ends. And, and, and this is why it's, it's important that we understand both sides of the coin. Because in verse 25, it says, Husbands, love your wives, even as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it. So even though we have the authority to command our wives, what is expected of a husband is that he is willing to die for his wife as Jesus Christ died for the church. That he might sanctify and cleanse it with the washing of water by the word that he might present it to himself a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that it should be holy and without blemish. So when it talks about Jesus Christ loving the church, is there anything there about just making the church, uh, you know, an oppressive servant, not caring about the church at all? Look, it's, it's like the reason why Jesus Christ came was to die for the church. So when you think about men being in charge, yeah, that's one side of the coin. Men are given the authority. The other side of the coin is that what is expected of men as the leader, and they ex are expected to love their wife even as Christ loved the church. So ought men to love their wives as their own bodies. He that loveth his wife loveth himself. For no man ever yet hated his own flesh, but nourisheth and cherisheth it even as the Lord the church. So men are in charge. Men are, you know, like Christ is to the church. And just like the church is subject unto Christ, women or the wives are subject to the husbands. But the husbands are expected to love their wife as Christ loved the church. That's what God's intention is. Now, let's talk a bit about how do you get your wife to follow you? you know, like people ask me this all the time. You know, maybe they're having trouble leading their wife. And they ask, you know, like, how do I, you know, my wife just won't listen to what I say. She won't do what I say. Um, so people ask, hey, how do you get your wife to follow you? How do I get my wife to submit to you? Well, let's look at a few leadership principles in the Bible and let's talk about a few examples. In 1 Peter 5, we read about what God expects of leaders in the church. And we can apply that to our own families. First Peter 5, The elders which are among you I exhort, who am also an elder, and a witness of the sufferings of Christ, and also a partaker of the glory that shall be revealed. Feed the flock of God which is among you, taking the oversight thereof, not by constraint, but willingly, not for filthy lucre. So he's saying, he's saying leaders ought to have the right mindset, why they want to be in charge. And it's the same in our marriage. You know, do you want to be in charge as a man just so you can order a, a woman around? If that's, if that's your mentality, that is so ungodly. You know, you, we should have the mentality. The reason why we, we ought to want that authority is so that we can take care of our family. Right? We're using that authority to make sure our family makes the right decisions, that we can make sure our wife makes the right decisions. We take some oversight there for the right reasons. But of a ready mind. Verse 3, neither as being lords over God's heritage, but being examples to the flock. 
And when the chief shepherd shall appear, ye shall receive a crown of glory that fadeth not away. So what is my point here in this verse if you're asking the question, hey, how do I get my wife to follow me? How do I get my wife to submit to me as a leader? Well, my question to you from this passage is, well, what are you doing? Are you lording or are you leading? Are you lording or are you leading? What do you mean by that? Are you just exercising your authority, just trying to tell your wife what to do, but your example is pitiful? You know, you as a, as a leader are, are lazy, you're indecisive, you don't make the right choices, you give your wife no confidence to submit to you. So it's, when, when it comes to leading your family, it's not just about, sh she won't do what I say. You need to ask the question, why won't she do, why isn't she doing what I'm asking her to do? Why won't she listen to me? Why won't she follow my lead? Why won't she trust my decisions? And that comes down to your example. You know, your example as a man, your testimony as a man, how you uh, go about your things, your work ethic, these all come into play if you want to influence your wife to make it easier for her to submit to your leadership. Isn't it the same at work? I mean, if you have a boss that's lazy, doesn't listen, makes bad decisions, isn't it harder to do what they say when they give you, uh, you know, something to do? But if you have a boss that works hard, is, is there with you, they understand, you know, they, you see them working hard, they got the right ethic, I mean, aren't you going to follow them a lot? It's going to be a lot easier for you as an employee to follow that sort of manager than it is to follow a manager that you have no respect for. Well, man, you've got to think about that in your families. It's the same at home. If your wife doesn't respect you, is your, if your wife sees you as somebody that's lazy and doesn't know what they're talking about, you're making it a lot more difficult for her to follow you than otherwise it would be. And that's why the Bible says here that we don't, when we rule the church, it's the same way. We rule the church not by just take, being a lord over God's heritage and just like, you know, I, mean, I, I just get to sit and just get fanned by big palm trees and eat grapes and just tell you guys what to do. I need to be working as well. And in fact, I should be the hardest worker in this church. And that's how I'm going to lead. I'm going to lead by my example. Is if I work hard, yeah, I've got five children, but I'm still going soul winning. I'm still making sure I'm at church. I'm putting in the hours as well. That's the example I'm trying to set for you guys. So when I ask you to do that, it's a lot easier for you guys to follow that, right? Because you can't say, oh, Victor doesn't do it. He's just expecting us to do something that he wouldn't do himself. So it's the same when it comes to your family. If you want to lead your family spiritually, you need to be a good example to help your wife submit. Now, does that justify women not following? Of course not. So even if your husband is a bad leader, if you don't submit to him, you're in sin. But what I'm talking about, I'm talking to the men right now, is if you want your wife to respect you and you want to lead that family, you need to be a leader worth following. And if you are, then she's going to respect you. She will follow you. It'll be a lot easier to, to get her to obey God if you are obeying God yourself. Look at what it says here in uh, 1 Timothy 4. It says, These things command and teach. Let no man despise thy youth. But be thou an example of the believers in word, in conversation, in charity, in spirit, in faith, in purity. So it's not just in our family life, but that's the application we're talking about tonight. It's in church as well. We need to be an example in church. So when you think about being a leader, leading your home, what does it mean if you're a leader? It means you're in front. That's pretty basic, right? But if I'm a leader, I've got to be in front. I've got to be better. I've got to be more zealous. I've got to be more passionate. That's what it means by leading your home. Right? Leading means you do things. So when you think about our spiritual life, right? And you want to lead your home. Well, does your wife know more Bible than you do? If she does, then you're not leading. Because you're not in front. You know, when it comes to conversation, if you're a leader in your home, are you the one that initiates conversation? Or does your wife always have to initiate conversation when it comes to spiritual conversation? It may be, you know, dealing with conflicts. If you're a leader in your home, then you're going to take the initiative 
to handle that conflict first because you're the leader. You know, if you're expecting your wife to always fix the problems, then you're not leading your home as you should. This is what God expects of us as, as leaders. You know, when it comes to Bible reading, does your wife read more Bible than you do? If your wife is reading more Bible than you do, then you're not leading your home. You need to lead in your home by being in front, being better, doing more Bible reading. Soul winning's the same. You're leading your home in soul winning. Do you, are you the one prompting your wife, saying, hey, we should be go, let's go soul winning. I need you to go soul winning this Sunday. I need some, a lady for, for you to go soul winning with. Or is it your wife saying, you know what? Should we be going soul winning this week? And you're like, oh, I don't know. I've got plans this week. You know, and you're not leading your home. It's the same with everything. Church attendance is the same. You know, is it, is it your wife saying, hey, we should be going to church? Or is it you going to church, being the leader there? Being the leader in prayer as well. You know, you, if you don't have prayer, if you don't have a time of prayer with your family, then start one. You know, in our family, we, we made it a tradition where we just pray together before we go to bed. So we all get together, we get on our knees, we just pray for a few things, you know, thank God for the day. But that's something that I put in place. So it's the same in your family. If there's something that's not put in place, you know, you as the man, you're the leader. You have to lead your home and put it in place. Don't wait for your wife to do these things. Even when it comes to roles, right? I'm going to go to Colossians 3. So this is the parallel passage to Ephesians 5. Wives, submit yourselves unto your own husbands as it is fit in the Lord. Husbands, love your wives and be not bitter against them. Now, if you're a leader, how does a leader read that passage? Well, I'll tell you how a, I'll tell you how a follower reads that passage. You know, somebody who's not, in, not, in, not a leader. They'll read that passage and think, my wife doesn't submit to me. You know, if you would just obey, Elizabeth, if you would just obey verse 19 more, or verse 18 more, then, you know, things would be a lot easier at home. But no, that's not how a leader thinks. How a leader thinks is he reads 19. And he says, he says to himself, Husbands, love your wives and be not bitter against them. You know, maybe my wife isn't submitting to me because I don't love her as Christ loved the church. And the focus is on improving yourself and improving your example. And I'll tell you what, if you become a man worth following, it'll be a lot easier for your wife to follow that command. I'm not saying it's just going to be easy as easy as pie, but it'll be a lot easier for a woman to follow somebody that she respects and is leading, not somebody who is, you know, of a bad example. What other areas of life I want to mention? You know, maybe it comes to your work ethic. Are you leading your home in your work ethic where you're not being lazy at home? If you expect your wife to work hard, are you working hard at home. What about leading your home emotionally? You know, we talked about ladies being more emotional than men when we talked about God's intention for the family. So in your, in your home, as a man, are you the one always getting upset? Are you the one always grumpy? You know, are you the one that you know, can't be approached because you're always having a bad day and you can't hold yourself together emotionally and lead your family that way? No, you as the leader in your home, as a man, should be leading in that area as well. Whereas maybe when you have an argument and things start getting a bit heated up, who's the calm one in that fight? Are you just as riled up as she is and now oh, you're getting away, you're slamming doors, you're throwing things as well? I would expect the man in that instance to be the calm one and say, you know what, let's, you know, let's deal with this properly, to be the one that tries to answer with a soft answer, to turn away the wrath. That's what it means to be a leader. A leader doesn't go, yeah, well, I wouldn't have got upset if she didn't get upset, and that's why I'm upset. Because you're the leader. And if you're the leader, you need to think, hey, emotionally I need to lead too. I need to know how to handle situations. Hey, if we have a conflict and we can't talk about it now, as the leader, you know, hey, later on I'm going to bring it up. When, you know, she's not as upset and handle it like a leader. The last example I want to talk about is this is are you leading when it comes to disciplining your children? Now, too many times, in, even in Christian homes, women are the one doing all the discipline. Right? And if, if your children 
fear your wife more than they fear you, let me tell you what, you are not leading your home when it comes to discipline. Because in my, in my home, my children are, are more scared of me than my wife. And it's not just because I have empty threats, or it's just like, you know, I just give them that look that they're scared of. The reason why that look is so scary is because there's something behind that look. And they know as well. Because when it comes to disciplining your children, you need to be a leader in that area too and not get slack and leave it all to your wife. The Bible says here in Ephesians 6, 6, 6 verse 4, And ye fathers, and ye fathers, provoke not your children to wrath, but bring them up in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. So it's a very famous verse where we bring up our children in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. But who is it an exhortation to? Is it an exhortation to women saying, mothers, bring up your children in the nurture and admonition of the Lord? Now, is it wrong for a woman to do that? Of course not. But who's meant to be leading that raising of the children in the nurture and admonition of the Lord? It's the fathers. So when it comes to nurturing the children, when it comes to admonishing the children, are you leading in that area as well? You know, do you show your wife how to discipline the children? You know, is she left to her own devices because she doesn't have a leader teaching her how, how to do it right as well? Or how to do it calmly? You know, some ladies are a lot, bit, a lot more emotional because they're more emotional. They get way more frustrated with the kids, right? And you're like, ah, we're yelling at them. Whereas I find like a, a man is a bit calmer, you know. I, I'm not saying I don't have those days sometimes, but I find it's a lot easier for a man to just take a child calmly, take him into the room, give him a spanking, and it's a lot more effective. But you know what? That's how men have to be. You have to make sure you're leading your home in all areas. Right? Leading your home in all areas, and especially when it comes to discipline. Make sure... You know, your children ought to fear you more than they fear mom. And you, you ought to be involved in your children's discipline. Don't leave it all to your wife. You know, sometimes you need to help out. You need to spank your children as well, not just leave it all to your wife. All right, let's go on to the last point. This is a quick point. But I wanted to mention why this is so important, why it's so important in this church that we have strong leaders, strong Christian leaders, in our homes. The Bible says here in Proverbs 22, train up a child in the way he should go and when he is old, he will not depart from it. This is why it's so important that, guys, we need to get serious about Christianity. We need to get serious about our faith. We need to get serious about the work of God. And why is it so important? You, know, you put off church that day, you put off soul winning, you put off Bible reading, keep putting off serving the house of God, serving God. You know what example it's setting for the next generation? Do we want to raise a generation that is like us? <laughs> like if you think about your own spiritual life and you think if every boy in the church right now, every young man in the church grew up and were like you, what sort of church would that be? But that's what's going to happen if that's the example that we set. And I don't want that to happen. That's why I want strong leaders in this church, strong Christian men that take the work of God seriously because that's the example that we're going to set for the next generation. And the Bible says, train up a child in the way he should go and when he's old, he will not depart from it. And you know, I don't want to train up children in the way where church is second priority. You know, in my family... They don't wonder what we're doing on Sunday. We don't wake up on Sunday and wonder where are we going to be on Sunday. And it's not just now that because I pastor a church. Even before I pastored a church, our fam we didn't wonder what was happening on Sunday. That's what I want to train up our children in the way. I want to train them up in the way where they expect where they're going to be on Sunday because that's what we did. They don't wonder what daddy's going to do on Sunday afternoon because they know daddy's going to be out soul winning. That's what I want to train children up in the way. And I don't want to train children up in the way where any little excuse gets us out of church. Where they think sports is more important than soul winning. Or they think that 
you know, be, having a little cough is an excuse to, to keep the whole family at home. This is what I mean by let's get serious about Christianity. We are such a weak, weak generation, you know, where we can't even come to church on time, let alone go to church multiple times a week. And we think we've got it tough as Christians. We, we don't have it tough at all. We've got it really easy. You know? But this is what we have to think about. We have to think about our example as believers and what example are we setting for the next generation. Do I want my children growing up thinking that soul winning is not that important? That if our family goes on a holiday, for example, that it's okay to skip church? How many Christians are like that? For some reason, Christians think, well, if I go on a holiday, it's okay not to go to church. It's okay not to go soul winning. I just, I just take a break from God. You know? and they, go, they go on holiday. They don't even look for a church to go to. I don't do any soul winning. That's not what how that's not how I want to raise my children, and that's not how I want children in this church to grow up with that sort of example. Do you want to, do you want a church where children can gr grow up, and you and you're constantly having to go? Don't follow that example. Don't follow that example. Don't follow that example. Wouldn't you want to come to a church where you can take your children there, and go? You know what? Follow that example. You know, you see that, you can follow, you, you can see all these examples in the church and you don't care who, who influences your child because there's enough good examples around to say, hey, this is somewhere where it doesn't matter who my child interacts with, they're going to interact with somebody that has a good example. They're a strong spiritual leader or they're a strong spiritual lady and we have good examples in this church. That's the sort of church that we want. And that's why it's so important. And it's going to start with the leaders. That's why, you know, that's why this sermon is geared towards the men in the congregation today because that's where it's going to start. If we want this church to have that sort of vibe, to have that sort of environment, to have that sort of example, where is it going to start? It's going to start with the men of this church. So if you guys don't start getting serious about the things of God, you know, nothing's going to change. The church will be the same and we don't want that. We don't want a church where it's just more lukewarm christianity all right let's pray thank you lord for your word thank you for uh the exhortation lord i pray that you know you pray that you would help me to just bring it across in the right spirit lord i'm not upset with anybody um, i just pray lord that you'd get a hold of our spirit just like we read about in haggai last week that you would stir our spirit that we would read these passages lord we'd not be upset uh, with anything that was said tonight, but we just read these passages and just challenge ourselves, Lord, and just think, Lord, I got to improve my spiritual life. I got to make a change. I got to think about the next generation and think about what example I'm setting in this church. And I just pray, Lord, that you'd help us to grow, me included, Lord. We need to, we need your grace. We need um, wisdom, Lord, and we need to make sure we set aside vain things in our life. Think about why we're here lord think about how we're affecting the next generation think about how we're leading our home and really up the bar lord and i pray that as men rise up and be stronger leaders i pray lord that we will lead our women and our children into a higher level of spirituality a higher bar so that ultimately lord we can do greater things for you bring more glory to your name Thank you, Lord, for being gracious with people that, you know, do not deserve your grace. And uh, we thank you, Lord, for Jesus Christ. Thank you that through him, even though we're not perfect, Lord, we can have everlasting life. We have a home in heaven. And Lord, you still love us the same yesterday, today, and forever. We thank you. We praise you in Jesus' name. Amen.